Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Improve Your Payment Processes. My name is Eric Wallace with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have a few administrative details to share with you, then we'll dig into our discussion. First, we'd like to thank Bill for their partnership with today's event. They've been wonderful thought leadership partners to Argyle, and they're committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. Thank you again to Bill. We appreciate you joining us today. We welcome you to stay connected during today's event. For those of you who are active tweeters, please follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum. I also wanted to take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we've curated based on the feedback we've received over the years from our members. Argyle is very proud and protective of this policy as it reflects our commitment to ensure the neutrality and overall value of the content presented at our events. We've worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our members' support of this policy. For those of you who are seeking CPE credit today, you must answer at least three polling questions and remain on the session for its duration. Polls can be found on the Polls tab on the right-hand side of your screen, right next to Chat. Afterwards, if you're eligible to receive credit, you will receive an email with a link to your certificates. If you have any questions about credits, please email cpe at argyleforum.com. Finally, and most importantly, please submit all your questions that come up during today's event into the chat section of the interface. Before we start, we'll have our speaker introduce himself, then we'll begin our discussion. Hey, Will, thank you for joining us today. Can you please introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit about your background with payment processes? Also, we have that we you'll see our first poll on the right hand side of the screen there. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, I'm Will Rozell. I'm currently the director of finance for Plumbing Distributors, Inc. Uh, I like to think of myself as a finance leader who leaves things better than I found them. Uh, over the course of my career, I've managed payment processes ranging from a small company AP team of one all the way up to a shared services AP team at a Fortune 500 company and pretty much everything in between those two uh, polar extremes. Great, thank you. So let's let's uh, start in with our, with our discussion. What are some ways that finance leaders can simplify payment processes without sacrificing rigor or audit readiness? Yeah, I think uh, probably the biggest uh, the biggest thing here that that I've come across is you know finding solutions that eliminate the need for paper checks, um, whether that's using virtual credit cards, uh, using ACHs and wires, or uh, finding a third party processor who kind of handles all that that uh, paper grunt work for you. Um, eliminating that paper just saves a, a ton of time for you and your team. Uh, and then also helps you save time during your audits uh, because uh, things like an ACH is much easier to prove to an auditor uh, from a paper trail standpoint than, than a paper check because you know typically a paper check, you have to, you cut the check and you put it in the mail and then it may be the next accounting period before that check actually clears the bank. So then, you know, when it comes audit time, you, you pull the check up in your system and it says August, but now you've got to go search, you know, maybe September, or even October, you know, sometimes even further out to find where that check actually cleared your bank account. And, uh, you know, it just creates a lot of extra, extra work. So anything you can do to eliminate the you know, paper checks, I think is, uh, is a huge step in that direction. Uh -huh. Thank you. Next question is, what are some specific things that leaders can do to improve their payment processes? Um, yeah, so I, again, I think, you know, eliminating the paper checks is, is, a, is a big key there. Um, but I think once you do that or as you're doing that, it's, it's key to really map out the processes for things that you're changing and making sure that, you know, your ERP system can handle those changes and how you're going to map those those processes out in that system to say, OK, we used to handle payments this way. Now we're going to change the process. And here are the new you know, five steps that we need to do to make sure that that payments are processed correctly. Um, and then identify if there are things in those processes that that you can streamline. Um, when I first joined PDI, we, we were paying uh, some vendors via a virtual credit card. Um, but it turned out to be a more uh, time consuming process for our AP clerk than just cutting a paper check because of the way that she was handling that process. She was basically double, double entering entries into the system. She would enter you know, one entry for the, the original vendor 
and then she would basically duplicate that entry on our credit card vendor uh, and have to manage basically both of those those vendors through the whole process. Um, so once once I came on board and, and we kind of identified that as a pain point, we walked through that process and we were able to come up with a, a much more streamlined process using a, an intercompany um, process that basically cut that that time in half. <clears throat> so I think you know it's it's key to really look at those processes and watch walk them all the way through to make sure that you are actually saving yourself time and effort. Great, thank you. So are there ways of the approvals process is frequently a source of bottlenecks and are there ways of streamlining the approval process without lowering your standards? Um, again, I think it, it, part of that is, is around, uh, if anything you can automate through a system, um, you know, third, a lot of the third party processors, you can have an approval process that kicks off all electronically so that people aren't having to manually chase somebody down for a signature to sign off on something. Um, those, those kind of things definitely make that approval process much more streamlined. Great, thank you. One, sorry for the delay. So what, when you're making it, when you're looking at your payment process globally, what criteria do you use when you're deciding to make a change to your payment processes? Uh, so kind of at the, at the high level, you know, I like to look at the amount of time that we're spending on the current process and the headcount that we need to support that. And then look at the the physical requirements. You know, um, you know, do we need you know with the current process, we need somebody in the office to actually cut the check. You know, that was a, a bit of a pain point during during the COVID lockdowns. You know, a lot of people had to scramble to figure out how to how to get their their processes uh, handled during that when people weren't in the office. Uh, one of the things that we constantly run into is we have basically two check signers in our, in our office. And so we have to confirm their schedules, you know, around our check runs to make sure that, you know, somebody's here to actually sign the checks when we, when we actually have them ready to go. Um, and then you also have to take into account the time that, you know, once you've got the check signed, you've got to get the check stuffed in an envelope and stamped and, and put in the mail. So there's a lot of physical, you know, manual efforts involved in that. Um, so looking at ways that you can, eliminate those those steps is is the key to me um, you know and making sure that the new process actually does save you time and, and save effort for everybody every step is an opportunity for mistakes to, to creep in yep so again this could be can also be lessons from the pandemic is what do you know now that you wish you'd known a year ago about improving payment processes? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think, uh, as we mentioned, you know, before, uh, you know, being able to confirm people's schedules and make sure that there are the, you have the right people around when you need them um, is, a, is a key. Um, we're actually looking at moving to a, uh, a third party to, to help eliminate some of that, that work on our end. Uh, and one of the things that uh, that we ran into as we were moving down that path is we you know, got got to the, the vendor selection process. We selected the vendor. Um, we thought we'd asked all the right questions. Um, we got into our, our first kind of uh, kickoff call with, with the vendor and, and, and the impl implementation team, uh, start talking through things. And we uh, ask a very, what we, what we thought was a very simple question was, okay, we see on the screen here how you enter the payment, you know, where, where all the, the data goes. Um, so when you're ready to cut the check, how do you calculate the discount that we, you know, because we have a lot of our vendors give us discounts. So how do we calculate that discount? And the person on the other end of the line got real quiet there for a minute. And they said, well, actually, our system doesn't do that. Um, so, you know, we we had to very quickly reevaluate what we were what we were going to get out of this out of this conversion, 
and and take a step back and say, okay, now we've got to we've got to find a different solution for the payment, you know, actual payment processing part of this process. Um, just wishing that we had you know vetted that entire process all the way through because a lot of vendors will keep the discussion at a very high level. And again, if you're not thinking of, of that full process all the way through and kind of confirming with with that vendor that they can handle your current requirements, uh, you'll 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 have a nasty surprise like like we did. Um, and I think one of the other things that we came across was making sure that uh, if there's any custom programming needed for your ERP system, uh, that you've got the right resources onboarded and ready to go for that, because there there may be things even with a third party system, if you're having data move back and forth between the two systems, you're going to have some customization work or some some uh, API type act activities that need to happen between the two systems. So you need to make sure that you've got the right resources lined up for that. Um, um, a couple of follow-up questions. One is, did you wind up breaking that part of the process out and using a different solution for that? Yeah, so that's that's where we're at now is basically we've, de we've determined that we've got, you know, a uh, front-end AP invoice capture process that we're going to use for the, or, the original vendor. And now we're looking at, at other vendors for the, the payment processing part of that on the back end. Um, so yeah, it's going to be completely two, two separate processes. We're going to get through phase one now with the invoice capture. Once that's up and running, then we've got a couple of vendors identified for the payment processing part that we, we will, uh, kind of decide between the two. And again, taking into account how much, uh, ERP customization or, or work is going to be required by each of those vendors will be a, a big factor that we'll definitely be looking at. Uh -huh. The other has to do with with programming and programmers. How can you, for people who aren't programmers, how can you tell that you have the skills you need or that you that you need to contract those skills out when you're when you're making these big changes? Um, I we usually start you know by talking with our IT team and seeing you know what skills do we have in house that we can utilize because obviously those are are a little easier to manage. Um, and then getting from them, you know, okay, we don't really have the skills in house to do this. So it's working with that IT team to say, okay, if you don't have those skills, what, what kind of uh, firm do we need to be looking at to get those skills from, from outside? Um, but because yeah, a lot of this, a lot of this uh, technical stuff, it, it, it goes right over my head, it goes over my boss's head. We're, we're, we're finance guys, we're not IT guys. So once, once they get into a certain level of, of IT speak, we're, we're just kind of there for the ride and uh, hoping that our IT team can can guide us in the right direction. Uh -huh. So moving off of IT, what are some improvements that finance teams can make to payment processes that will increase audit readiness? Um, so one of the things that we've we found useful uh, is you know, especially as we make changes in our payment processes and in our in our accounting processes, uh, is making sure that we're updating our process documents that walkthroughs that the auditors ask for every year. Um, you know, kind of being more proactive on that end, doing those, you know, keeping those those documents accurate and up to date, uh, definitely saves you a little bit of a crunch time during the audit when you're spending a lot of time dealing with other audit requests. You don't have to spend extra time going back and documenting things that that should have been kind of documented from the get go. Um, the other thing that I, that we try and do is whenever we're making a change, I also try and keep in mind how that's going to affect our audit come year end and, and manage that process on the front end to say, OK, not only does it have to do A, B and C, but I also have to be able to show my auditor, you know, the correct path and the and give them the proper documentation because i can create a process that works you know great internally but makes it you know can be difficult to to show to an auditor to, to give the auditor the information they need if that's the case then i've got to go back and rethink that solution because it doesn't really solve all of my problems auditors want to see you show your work they don't never ask for, an auditor just yeah to trust for some you, right? reason they don't just take you at your word these days <laughs> <laughs> now, so how can finance, the next two questions are related and are sort of related to audits as well. How can finance leaders improve their ability to detect payment payment errors? Yeah, 
Yeah, I, 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 this is one of those that to me, that's kind of a, there's a lot of basic blocking and tackling kind of activities that, that really, you know, still, still work no matter how, you know, complicated or, or big your processes get. Um, you know, one of the processes that I, that I still, still do to this day is uh, doing a regular review of the aged uncleared items, you know, uncleared checks that we've cut that haven't cleared the bank. Um, you know, just recently we found, you know, there was a check that's been sitting out there for, you know, 90 plus days. And so I have my team follow up on it. Well, come to find out, we cut a check to, you know, vendor A, who had a very similar name to vendor B. Um, and it was the wrong vendor, basically. So, you know, we, we assume that the check got to the, to the wrong vendor, and they just let it sit on their desk instead of, you know, cashing it, that's the, that's, you know, kind of one of the good things about, about the situation we found. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very easy to, to cut a check to the wrong vendor. If you're, again, if you're dealing with more manual processes. Um, Is that something that switching to an ACH uh, automated payment system would help, <clears throat> excuse me, help you address? Yeah, because, uh, you know, things like ACH, you know, the payment is is more immediately going to be sent to the to the vendor directly to their bank account, and then that kind of forces them to deal with it. So if we had, if we had sent that ACH to the wrong vendor, you know, it would a it would be reflected on our statement the next time we see the statement. Um, and, and that was one of the one of the other items I had on my on my list here was reviewing vendor statements for things like you know open payments. Um, cause a lot of times vendors won't necessarily tell you that there's an open payment on your account, but if you ask for a statement and it's there, you can identify it and you can track back to, to how it ended up there. Um, but yeah, having that, doing that through ACH definitely allows for less error. You know, the other thing we found with a lot of the, uh, you know, unclear checks is a lot of times the checks just for some reason don't seem to get to the vendor. Um, and uh, you know, we've, we've seen kind of an increase in that. I don't know what, you know, what's, what's going on at the post office these days, but we've seen kind of an increase in the amount of checks that either take a long time to get to someone or don't ever make it to them, um, that we end up having to go back and, and recut. Uh, so again, that's another, another thing an ACH would, would eliminate is that need to have to go back and recut a check that gets lost in the mail. Right. Next question is related, and that's how can finance leaders improve their ability to detect payment fraud? Uh, I think one of the biggest, uh, biggest things that, you know, I, I don't, uh, hopefully everybody, everybody is, is already uh, using it today, but positive pay is, is kind of, to me, the biggest, uh, the biggest way to, to help monitor that. Uh, we actually had, uh, an example, maybe last uh, quarter, where uh, we had a couple of checks that got that got um, intercepted and, and were basically uh, involved in check washing. Um, so somebody got a hold of a couple of our checks and made them out to to somebody else, and uh, you know, Positive Pay was able to catch that that right away because you know they didn't change the check number; they just changed who they made the check out to and the amount. So we got a notice, you know, from the bank, you know, right away when they when they took it to the bank, uh, and I think even the the second time it happened, the teller at the bank actually called us while they had the person at the at the desk to say, hey, this doesn't match your your positive pay information. Is this is this legitimate or not? And we were able to stop it right right there. So that's to me that's a huge huge thing. If if you're not using positive pay, you you've got to get that implemented because it these days that's you know just kind of a basic gotta gotta must have not a nice to have so wait there's there's an, this individual who's trying to to steal from your company and they're standing in line at the bank and they're face to face with the bank teller and they're on the phone with it what happened to that person so what we so, found out was that that, that person it. received the check from the per, from the original person who who basically stole the check they they got involved in a uh, employment scam basically so that it was one of those Hey, you know, we want to hire you for this job. 
you know, it's a remote job. We're going to send you a check for a thousand dollars so you can go buy your computer and printer and all that. So you go cash mm -hmm. check and go buy your stuff and then we'll, and then you send us back what you don't use. Right. So, uh, it really is, is a scam to cash us fraudulent check. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So unfortunately for that person, or maybe fortunately for them, they, they didn't get, you know, the, the, the cash that they had to worry about afterwards. But, um, I guess they found out the hard way that that job wasn't a real job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If something sounds too good to be true, it is. Right. Yeah. So moving along, um, what security concerns do finance teams need to keep in mind as they make changes to their payment processes? Um, so I think the first thing to look at really when you're changing those processes is any of the, are any of those new processes breaking any of your existing controls that you have in place? Um, so when we're looking at uh, this onboarding, this uh, invoicing, invoice capture system, uh, we had to kind of take a, a step at, back and make sure that we weren't, uh, we weren't allowing that system to create new vendors on the fly so that we could continue to monitor and, and control that new vendor creation process. Cause that's another, another one of those key areas where like an internal fraud kind of situation can occur if, if somebody is able to just go in and, and create vendors at, at their leisure. Um, so it's making sure that those, those processes don't, don't break anything that you've already got in place. And, you know, if it does, then figuring out how to, how to adjust that process to, to recapture that, that control. Um, and then the other piece, as we add, you know, these new systems is obviously making sure that access and permissions are, are set correctly for everybody on the front end so that you don't, don't accidentally give somebody more permission than they, than they really should have or need. Uh, that could create an opportunity for, for an issue down the road. When you're making a change like that, is there a way to test, like test to the change in a limited environment and then walk it back if you need to? Um, we, we have been able to do that sometimes. Um, you know, basically you kind of, you, you've set somebody's permissions to not be able to see something. So we've had them, we've had, you know, Hey, go log in, you know, have that person go log in and see if they actually, you know, if they can see this screen or not. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of one of the good things about kind of the, some of the newer systems is, um, you know, if you have access to something, you see it, if you don't have access to it, you don't ever even, you don't even see it as an option on your screen. Um, so, you know, if, if something's missing, you know, you know, it's missing, but if it's, if it's something you're not supposed to have and you don't see it, you never, you never knew that you, it was something you could have, you could have had. That's assuming that everybody's using their own credentials though. Like what's to stop someone from stealing someone whose credentials who has access to more material. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the, that's one of those other, you know, pieces that you can, you can control so much, you know, from a systems perspective, but at the end of the day, you know, you've, you've still got a human element involved. So you've got to keep an eye out for what, what those people are doing and then, you know, see if there's anything, you know, out of the ordinary for that, that person. Um, you know, one of our, our ERP system has a pretty good change log in place for logging what, what user ID is, is doing the activity. Um, so if we were to see, you know, if we've got a, an a, AP associate who's handles a certain set of vendors and all of a sudden, you know, they're on a different vendor, their ID is on a different vendor, you know, doing a bunch of weird activity, it kind of helps us, would help us to track, kind of track that activity down if we needed to. So what are some ways to reduce risk to your business, by, reduce your risk to your business by improving your payment processes? Yeah, I, I feel like a bit of a broken record, but yeah, I, I keep coming back to that elimination of paper checks. It, it eliminates a lot of a lot of variables out out of that system, um, and that's you know, definitely something we're we're very anxious to get to that part of our of our implementation process so that we can uh, reduce those items. Um, you know, so if we weren't if we weren't cutting checks today, we wouldn't have run into the the check washing issue. We wouldn't have run into the you know, paying the wrong vendor issue that we ran into. Um, the other, the other thing, uh, especially if you're using, you know, when you're dealing with a one-off vendor, 
uh, if you're able to pay them via credit card, uh, that definitely preserves uh, your ability to dispute that charge if something were to go wrong, or if, if you find out later that the, the vendor you know over promised or or couldn't couldn't deliver. Um, I've seen we've had that happen in 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 the past at, at some of my other other jobs, where you know we were very very lucky to be able to use a credit card to, to make a payment to a vendor um, because we would find out later you know either they didn't have what they said they did or they sent us the wrong thing. And then it gave us that leverage to be able to get them to, to come back to the table and work with us. Whereas if we've just sent a, a payment to them, you know, it becomes a lot harder to get somebody to, to come back to the table at that point. What are some, when that has happened, what are some ways that you use to get people to, to uh, come back to the table and, and return the money you sent them? Um, so, you know, it, it has, has varied, but yeah, um, like if uh, we we were um, involved in a kind of uh, industry organization, so there you know we tried to deal with vendors who only you know were certified or had membership with a certain vendor organization, kind of to, that gave those vendors a a, a um, you know kind of stamp of approval or you know almost like a better business bureau. Hey, these businesses are are you know kind of on the up and up. Um, if they were in in that group, we had some leverage to go back to the to that group and say, you know, we could actually lodge a complaint through that group and say, hey, you know, we tried to to we've we've got an issue with this vendor, they're not responding. Um, you know, we want to report that that you know as a a violation of of their uh, you know agreement with the with the buying group or whatever to to act you know the way that they're supposed to act. And a lot of times that would that would spur that vendor to come back to the table and say, "Oh, hey, can you? I'll, I'll work with you and clear this up. Can you kind of with, withdraw that that complaint against me so I don't, you know, don't get dinged or don't get kicked out of the group?" But belonging belonging to that group gave you a way to get the vendor's attention. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it's basically it's you know kind of that peer pressure. They they know that that you know that that complaint would be seen by a lot of the a lot of the vendors they deal with, not just us. So they, they want to make sure that, that, uh, that they don't have anything out there that would keep people from buying from them. The next question is how, and how can leaders build support and buy in on their teams for changes to the payment processes? And I would like to call everyone's attention to the second poll, which you'll see um, momentarily on the right hand side of your screen. So how can we, how can we build support and buy-in for some of these very difficult changes? Yeah, I think um, to me it's been you know for the like for the project that we're working on now it, it was um, showing the team members you know when when we roll out this new process how much of the the manual and repetitive tasks that was going to come off of their of their workload on a daily basis um, and showing them you know instead of having to do you know all this data entry every day now you're going to be able to spend more time actually being more proactive with your vendors being able to follow up on issues being able to review your statements in a more timely manner and catch miss, missing invoices and uh you know help make sure that that we're paying our vendors on time as opposed to just sitting there you know every day just keying numbers into the into the system um and we got a, an immediate you know, immediate buy-in off of that. And they're, you know, the team is ready, ready to go at that point. So I think you have to show, you know, that the change you're making is going to positively impact the team and not something that you're just either making for, you know, change for change's sake or uh, something that is going to benefit somebody else, right? You know, somebody higher up in the, oh, well, that, that makes it easier for the, you know, CFO, but it doesn't really do anything for me. Those are tougher you know, things to, uh, to try and get, get behind. But if I can show somebody, Hey, this is going to immediately, you know, impact your work for the better and make your, make your life easier. Then I find I don't have, I don't get a whole lot of pushback on that. Good. So the, then mo moving along, this is another sort of, how do you manage a big change? How do you keep your documents organized as you make the transition from paper files to electronic files once you're as you're getting paper checks and, and all the paper that goes around them behind you 
Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, when you move or moving to that more digital uh, format, it's really around putting thought into that design of the process and then also making sure that that process is, is well documented and then well trained to, to the individuals that are going to be using the process. Um, so making sure that they understand, you know, all the way through, okay, this is, this is the new process that I need to follow. Um, and then kind of going back and, and double checking them, you know, when the, when the new process kicks off, kind of going back and doing some spot checks and saying, okay, yeah, it looks like this person's got, got the process down. Uh, looks like this other person, you know, they may need a refresher. We may need to go back and, and do some additional training with them because they don't seem to be, to be getting it. Or, you know, you may have, I have had a few people on, on staff from time to time who just were just by nature resistant to change. And if they didn't really want to do it, you kind of would have to keep going back to them and saying, no, this is, this is what's happening now. So you, it has, has to get done this way. What are they, how do you, let's, let's talk a little bit more about how we get through resistance to change. Like, what do you, how do those conversations go? What do you, what ways have you used to persuade people who are really, um, sticking there, digging their feet in. Yeah. I mean, the, the kind of the first thing is just understanding, Hey, you know, do you understand, you know, why we're doing this new process or why we're doing this, you know, why we've changed the way we're doing this. Um, that, that's kind of the first thing because sometimes they may, you know, you're all sitting in a group and you explain it to the group. Nobody really necessarily wants to raise their hand and say, oh, I don't understand. Um, but one-on-one -on -one, you can, you have a little bit more, openness sometimes for this somebody to come back and say, well, I don't really, I don't really get it. Um, <clears throat> and they may be very comfortable in the existing, in their existing process. And they say, well, I, I, you know, I just feel like, I feel like this is better for me. And at that point you have to go, well, it's better. It may be better for you, but here's how it, it's better for, you know, the other 10 people in the, that have, that have to deal with this. So now if, if you don't do this, then that affects this person, this person, and this person. And I, I find a lot of times once you start to lay out those impacts, you know, that it's not just, it's not just something that affects them. It also starts to affect their, their coworkers and people around them. People are a lot more willing to, to make that change because nobody really wants to, you know, cause problems for, the, for their coworkers. They want to, they want to make sure that everybody, you know, that they're treating everybody the way they want to be treated, right? Nobody wants to be that person who's holding everything right. up and who's not learning the new system. So if you've already made that transition to electronic files, how do you keep them organized and audit ready? Yeah, so again, I think the training on the front end and is is a big a big part of that and then doing any follow-up training that you need to do if you start to again if you start to identify somebody who's you know either was doing really well at first but kind of slacked off or who isn't quite you know isn't quite getting it from the get-go being able to go back and and touch base with them um to me that's or and, and going back to them and saying you know maybe they misunderstood a part of the process and that that's what's causing the issue. So it's really going back and understanding, you know, where, where's the root cause of, of the breakdown? Is it, is it just, you know, a simple thing that can be fixed or is it a more complicated thing? You know, maybe there's a, maybe you made the, you know, process that sounds really uh, simple to you. You show it to three other people and they're all scratching their head going, I don't, I don't get it. I don't follow it. So then you have to maybe go back and make some changes to the, to that process with that additional feedback. Uh -huh. How can you, on the subject of training, how can you tell what training you need and how do you, how, how do you go about meeting those needs? Um, so I would typically meet with, you know, so, so say, you know, myself, my AP manager, we're getting ready to make a change. You know, we would, we would kind of go walk through that process. Uh, identify, you know, what kind of training we think is, is necessary for, for that change. Uh, and then we would kind of, uh, roll that out from there. That, in, that uh, insightful discussion, we'd like to jump into a Q and a from the audience. Now I encourage attendees to submit your questions using the chat feature on the right hand side of your screen. 
So why don't we just jump right in and uh, address some of the questions that have come up from the audience uh, during our presentation. The first one is, we are struggling to get started with improving our payment processes. Do you have any advice for us? Um, yeah, I would say, you know, probably the, the best thing, the, the best way to start would be to go out and into the market and kind of see what items, what options are available. Um, you know, go sit in on some, some demos with, with, you know, three or four different vendors, um, reach out to a couple of vendors and, and get them, you know, if, if they don't do, you know, kind of on demand demos, reach out to a couple of vendors and have them come in and, and provide a demo to you. Um, they're, they're more than willing to do that. Uh, what I found is you kind of going through those demos, you'll see, Hey, there's a function there that I really like, or that, you know, you'll see things that really jump out to your, you and your specific process, maybe more so than, than, uh, other people. Um, and sometimes even the, the vendor themselves won't necessarily call something out as a, a key feature, but you look at it and you go, Oh, that's, that's game changing for, for our, for our group. Um, so that that would, to me would be the the best first step is is go out there and see what's available, see what the options are, especially if you haven't if you haven't done any of that homework to begin with. Once you've once you've gotten a sense of your options and you've picked one and you're you're making trying to make some progress with it, what do you do? At least in my experience, there's always a point where you get stuck when right. you're adopting a new process or a new technology. What do you what can you do to get unstuck? Um, so I think it's at that point it becomes identifying, okay, you know, what are the, what are the one or two items that we are, are stuck on and then drilling down into those items and saying, okay, why are we stuck on this? What resources do we need to bring on, you know, backing up and saying, okay, you know, we've got a contractor working on this, but he keeps hitting, you know, hitting a log jam with the, with the vendor. Um, do we need to now get somebody else on the vendor side involved to help the contractor get through? Do we need to bring an additional contractor resource on, you know, to help help move this thing forward? Uh, so it's just identifying, you know, what specifically is holding things up, and then what specific actions can we take to to resolve those items? Is it, and it usually it, it involves getting somebody at the next level up, either at the vendor or at the consultant level, involved to help move things forward. Uh huh. Thank you. So next question is, what's the biggest mistake you've seen companies make in trying in trying to improve their payment processes and how do they get past it? Um, I think probably the biggest mistake is is trying to move too fast on something. So, you know, seeing seeing something and saying, oh, I want to I want to jump right on that. I want to implement that right away without really doing some of that pre-work ahead of time to really map out, okay, if I make this change, what is that going to affect? Um, you know, we've, uh, in one of, one of my previous positions, we were moving from a, from a uh, local AP handling of, of process to a shared services model. Uh, and there was not enough um, pre-work done on the, on the front end to map out, okay, now, when you when I make this switch from a local AP contact to a shared services AP contact, how is that going to work for the vendor if they have an issue with you know with an item, or how is that going to work with our you know warehouse team when there when there's a, a receiving issue? How you know without working through those processes and just dumping everything over into the shared services group. Uh, it just created a whole lot more problems because now all of a sudden vendors weren't getting paid because invoices weren't getting processed because nobody knew how to resolve the the problems with the the invoice. So how did how did you get past that? Uh, a lot of a lot of meetings and a lot of retraining and a lot of hey you know you should be doing X Y and Z instead of A B and C when when this comes up. Um, the next question is, how do you think payment processes are going to evolve over the next couple of years? Um, over the next couple of years, I think, I think we should see more people moving, moving to, you know, paperless. Um, I would love to, to see, um, 
you know, potentially more direct connections between a vendor and a customer to be able to, to make that payment process uh, easier. Um, yeah, there's right now we have EDI feeds that, that do kind of invoicing, the invoicing side of things. Um, I don't think we have a whole lot of, of that on the payment side just because of, uh, I think, you know, everybody is a little hesitant to, to move in that direction, but I think we might see things move more in that direction where you can, can automate more of that process. And if, if that's through a third party, um, you know, just so you have a little bit more control over the process, I think that's what we will probably see. Great, thank you. So the next question is, uh, next audience question is, wouldn't you want to meet with your stakeholders first to get an idea of what functions they're lacking and what functions they find unnecessary? Then with your list, you can visit with different vendors. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you definitely, you can, you can definitely um, start, start internally and then, and then move to the, to the external, to the, to the vendors to get their demos, to see if they hit all of those, all those points or which one hit, hit those points. Um, I think sometimes your, your stakeholders may not necessarily know, you know, they may not have an idea of what's, what's out there as well. Um, so they may be more, you know, I guess less inclined to think about how to change a process or how to improve a process more so than, you know, I, they may just be happy with the, with the way things are currently. Um, but I, I think, you know, when you get to kind of the, the stage where you're selecting a vendor, you definitely want to come back, you know, circle back with the group and say, Hey, we're looking at this, you know, at this vendor, let's walk everybody through a demo, show them all what, what the new, the new system looks like. And at that point, the, you know, there's definitely a good place for them to, to identify areas where things don't quite work right or where things can be better. Great, thank you. Next question is, is for a, from a popular topic. Is there a role for artificial intelligence in payments? Can an AI handle some of the more repetitive work? Um, yeah, I, I would say so. I think that's what we're, what we're seeing with a lot of the, the third party, um, software that we're seeing now is the, uh, on the back end. They're using a lot of that to say, Hey, you know, I can tell, you know, this, the system, um, you know, when, it, when this invoice comes in, you know, the invoice number is always here. The invoice amounts here, the PO number is here. Uh, they're doing a lot of those kind of things. And then also, you know, on the back end of the system, on the payment side, uh, or on the coding side, when they, you know, if an invoice for a utility company comes in and it always gets coded a certain way, you can certainly build that in, into that kind of a process. Um, and I could see that going even further down into the, into the payments process where, you know, you've obviously got the data in the system, you know, the payments due on, you know, 1031, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be, uh, there's no reason a system or robot RPI couldn't couldn't put that payment out there, you know, ready for approval without anybody having to touch it. The next question is: um, We are looking to hire new AP staff. What skills do we need to emphasize as we recruit people in this very challenging recruiting environment? Uh, I think probably one of the key skills for an AP person these days is attention to detail. Um, you know, being able to identify when when something's not right, uh, and being able to uh, then kind of once you've identified that, then work we're being able to work through and resolve the issue. Um, that's where you know a lot of AP teams kind of. Miss, miss or AP team members miss the mark as you know they can come in and process invoices all day long but if they're not really paying attention to that that detail you know to know when something's off they just keep entering stuff you'll you'll find those errors down the road um, uh, next next question is um, we are an international nonprofit that employs several people to do data entry as that becomes less necessary, how can we help them grow their skills? 
Um, so I think, you know, when you're in those kind of situations, you, you start looking at what other needs are, are within the organization that you can, you know, see if they have an interest in, is there, you know, an area around marketing or around, um, you know, some of the other, other sides of, of accounting, um, maybe that somebody, you know, it shows an interest in, um, it, you know, with it being a, a nonprofit, I'm, I'm guessing sales is not necessarily a, a, an area of focus, but just looking around at those other areas to say, you know, and, and asking the question to that, to the person involved, hey, you know, as your AP, you know, and, and data entry parts of the, your job are going away, kind of what, what areas interest you within the organization that you'd like to explore and then figure out if you can find a good match there. Great, thank you. So next question is, is a sensitive one. What steps should you take if you have reason to believe that someone is trying to steal from the company by creating false invoices? Wow. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the first, first step to me would be to let, you know, the leadership of the company, you know, or your, your direct leadership know, you know, what you're, what you're suspecting so that everybody is aware of the potential issue. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's doing some very serious investigation into the, into the details to try and identify, is this truly fraudulent activity that's going on? Um, and if that, you know, you may, you may need to even bring in somebody who's kind of specializes in that, in that area. Uh, I know there's definitely lots of uh, forensic accountants who specialize in, in doing that kind of, of research. So if you, if you kind of do your digging on your own, you feel like there's an, enough evidence there that, that this might be the case, then it might be time to bring in a third party to really be able to, who, who's kind of specializes in that, to be able to, to dig into it further. Um, and, and really get, get down to it and determine is, is there really a fraud issue happening here or not? Um, and I would say, you know, once you're kind of, even before when you, when you have that kind of first inkling that something might be going on, then that's the time to start really looking at your current processes and are there things that you can tighten up on without really necessarily telling everyone, you know, telling people that, that you think there's fraud going on, but, maybe you've gotten a little lax in some of your processes, so you need to tighten them back up to say, okay, let's tighten this back down and, and see kind of how, how they react to that. What are, some, what are some ways you would use to choose a third party, to choose a forensic accountant or whatever professional you needed for that? Um, so if you're already working with, you know, like we have a, you know, a CPA firm that, that we deal with, you know, for our audit or for our tax, tax needs, um, you can you know, definitely reach out to them, and if they don't have a group within their within their organization that that does those kind of things, they should have uh, contacts for that kind of activity to be able to help identify somebody. Great, thank you. That's um, that's all the questions we have for today. Thank you, Will, for this excellent presentation, and thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining us today for this excellent webinar. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day.